we generalized our projection method into two dimensions. So we draw our two-dimensional domain. We discretize the two-dimensional domain into triangles. And we solve the Poisson's equation by projecting the Poisson's equation into a finite dimensional space. Right? We said that the residual of the Poisson's equation has to be orthogonal to any function that lies in that finite dimensional space. And then we also represented our solution as a linear combination of the same, uh, the, the basis function of the same space. That gives us the same number of equations as the number of variables. We solved the linear solution with finite element. So when I was I I, sh I was showing the like my video recording, which I know messed up a little bit at the end uh, to my wife last night, and she was like, "Did you ever explain what the space means?" And I was like, "No." So so I want to uh, take uh, some time to explain a little bit of the mathematical foundation of finite element. For example, what what do I mean by a space of functions? Does anybody understand what I mean by a space of functions when I was talking about that? Okay, you understand? You understand? You understand? It's good. Can, can you say a little bit like uh, what what is a space of functions? A space means a vector space. Very good. Go on. What is a vector space? Your linear algebra is very good. <laughs> so I see like you have received uh, the, uh, a very formal training of linear algebra. So, so let me... Uh, so let me explain to those who are not, uh, who may not have received such a rigorous training of linear algebra, or who has forget a little bit of that, what what do I mean by a space? So a space X, X is a vector space. So it's a vector space. I'm going to only discuss a vector space with respect to the real, uh, with real, with respect to real numbers. Instead of, I mean, if you receive formal training, you're probably looking at a field, but like, uh, it's a vector space. Uh, oh, I didn't change that. Okay, so so X is a vector space. Vector space. Uh, if the following holds, okay. So so basically, we uh, together together with. Uh, uh, so we, when we define a vector space, we also need to define a addition and uh, multiplication, right? Actually, let me do this multiplication. Uh, if the following is true, so first of all, if if a uh, if a, b, and c are all in the vector space, then a plus b is equal to b plus a. So it's just uh, the very Fundamental, uh, fundamental commutation uh, of of the the addition attractor. So, so now I have a space that enforces not only the function is it doesn't the square of the function doesn't integrate to infinity. I also enforce that the square of the derivative does not integrate to infinity. And you can also convince yourself this is a proper function space. So do we have a, let's, let's go through some examples and you can tell me the particular function I'm writing, is it part of the L2 space? Is it part of the H1 space? And here the one means uh, first order derivative. If I take two here, then I need to add also second order derivative over here. If I take three, then I need to be three times differentiable, and the three times derivative has to integrate to uh, finite. All right. So for example, let me define my uh, let me define my domain to be. I don't like gray here. Uh, let me define my domain to be one dimensional and let me take zero, actually, let me actually take zero to infinity. Okay. 
okay, what if fx is, uh, let's say, 1 over x is this is this function within the space l2 or is it within the space l h1 why or why not good so so it is not in l2 because if i integrate the square of this function dx over the whole domain around 0 it is the limit of this integral, if I take it to epsilon, epsilon goes to zero. It will diverge to infinity. So, so the integral is actually equal to infinity. It is not in L2. How about H1? No, because any function within H1 has to be in L2. Right, so that's not the case. Okay, how about this? Hmm? It's in H1. Why is it now in H1? It's shifted, so the point at x equal to 0 is no longer a problem, right? How about at infinity? Very good. So, so first of all, it's in L2, because if you, if you square this, uh, if you take a 1 over x plus 1 square, because this function f square goes like 1 over x square as, as you go to infinity. It is, it is integrable to infinity. And when you take a derivative, f prime of, f prime decays at the rate of x square, right? Once you take a derivative, 1 over x square. So f prime square goes like one over x to the fourth. It decays faster or slower. It decays faster, so it's integrable. So this function is in both L2 and H1. OK. All right. Can somebody take any, give, any, uh, give me an example in the same space that is in L2 but not in H1? One over square root of uh, should the plus one be outside or inside the square root? Inside, x plus one. Okay. Why is it in? So first of all, why is it in L two? Okay, we can remove the plus one. So you want the square root. Good, you're focused on the point zero, right? So it turns out as you go to infinity, once you take a derivative, it decays faster, right? So so you can't really construct a, a function that lies in L2 but not in H1 by looking at infinity. But you you have a very good intuition that you should be looking at around the point zero. Okay, so, so you're saying 1 over square root of x, is that square integrable at zero? Yes, instead of taking x uh, to the power of half or minus half, if you take x to the power of one third. Oh, okay. So you are you are you are saying square root of x. It's square root of x from zero to one. Okay, or if you can just take square root of x over one plus x. All right, so that. We'll have something that is, uh, uh, no, that's not, that's not square integrable. Or if I, if I make it this, right. So now we get something that is square integrable over this whole domain, but at the zero, at, at the point zero, once you take a derivative, okay, it is no longer square integrable. So, so if I have this function, then f is in the space L2, but f is not in the space of H1. All right, any any questions on on the the two different Sobolev spaces? 
So when you take a derivative, you get some different properties than the function itself, right? And uh, I I can I can give you another intuition. Oh, I can give you another way of thinking about the problem. So if you have a function x f, let's say if you have a finite domain in this case, I have a function that is really sharp that goes towards one like that okay that function if you think of the norm in l2 so the norm in l2 is equal to the square root of the integral of f square dx right if you think of the norm of this function in the l2 norm is it small or big it's very small. Actually, the narrower you make this uh, this function, the smaller the L2 norm is, right? Because f squared is kept at 1. Okay, if you take the same function and look at the H1 norm, which is defined as f squared plus f prime squared, the derivative square dx to the half power. Is this, does this function have a large or small norm in H1. It can be really big. And actually, uh, that's because I'm taking the derivative squared. Okay, and the derivative of this function is inversely proportional to how narrow the, f the function is. If, I, if the width of this pulse is delta, then the derivative is proportional to 1 over delta, and the square of the derivative is proportional to 1 over delta square. Okay, so even if the derivative is integrated over a domain of width of delta, it's still going larger and larger as I make the delta smaller and smaller. As I make the width to be infinitely small, the H1 norm is infinitely large. All right. So that makes something like a delta function to be have an infinite H1 norm. All right. Any questions on this? The the weird things about defining spaces on functions and putting putting the notion of a norm, okay, on these uh, on these spaces of functions. The, the norm of these functions, like what we define here and here, is going to be it's going to be quite important uh, when we start to look at not only how to solve the equation using finite element, but also looking at how much error we are making when we are solving equation with finite element. All right. Okay. Uh, so now we have defined the space of functions. 